We will be having an exciting panel discussion on the topic sharing economy and emerging leadership. We, the students of Sri Balaji Society, are fortunate to witness the presence of our eminent panel members who are going to discuss on the topic, which is very relevant in today's context. Companions, I, Rishabh Singh Bharat, student manager of Shri Balaji Society, feeling privileged to introduce you to all the versatile personality, Mr. Balaji Raman. Telecom expert with over 16 years of experience in telecom industry and eight years in automotive industry. Sir is currently Circle CEO, Maharashtra and Goa Circle from 1st March, 2017. Conclusively, he would say, let our circles sprawl with positivity, energy, and let ideas flow with freedom. In short, let make Indus the magical place which we all dreamt working for. Thank you. He will be the part of our panel member. I, Rahul Kumar Das, student manager of Sri Balaji Society, feels privileged to introduce you to a renowned personality, Mr. Rajiv Berman. Sir is the head of the Human Resources for, for Konos Incorporated. Sir is responsible for leading the company's HR strategy to drive employee engagement and business growth in Australia, China, India, and New Zealand. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Rajiv Berman, sir, to join the panel discussion. I, Ms. Eshwarya Mori, student manager of Sri Balaji Society, feels privileged to introduce you all the charismatic personality amongst us, Ms. Joita Chatterjee. Ma'am is an HR professional who is driven by her passion to develop people and enable them in their personal journeys towards excellence. The past 23 years of professional career with top MNCs and Indian companies has helped her to develop her own skills in areas such as career advice, coaching, and mentoring. Ma'am is an alumnus of Symbiosis Institute of Business Management, Pune, 1994 batch. Ma'am has worked with various companies like Ranbaxi, Jubilant Life Sciences, and Nautil in various capacities. So may I now request ma'am to be a part of our panel discussion. Thank I, you. Rahul Kumar, feel privileged to introduce you all a dynamic personality, Mr. Napneet Singh. Currently, sir is responsible for handling the business partnership for one of the largest functions in the organization. Sir is currently working as Assistant Vice President Human Resources at Home Credit India and has worked with companies like India Mart Intermesh Limited, Sarko, One Touch Solutions, Logical Outsourcing Private Limited, and Knoxville Infotech. So, sir, we will be the part of our panel discussion. Thank you. So, um, may I request uh, Balaji, could we get started with you on what is your take on the shared economy? Okay, good afternoon. It's a matter of irony for me to answer, you know, which way, because, you know, I have already, uh, you know, my opinions are foregone. So I'm coming from an industry which is actually working on the space of, you know, sharing economy. And uh, uh, all I need to say at this moment, as in my opening remark, is all about, you know, how this is going to evolve as a, you know, uh, uh, next paradigm uh, to this entire economic development, per se. Uh, in the past, uh, we all know that you know a consumption economy is all about you know state of ownership. Now, um, I think that is that is getting disrupted uh, at the thought levels of all these millennials. Um, you know, uh, who thinks uh, completely different out of the box and uh, come up with uh, completely disruptive thoughts in terms of you know how uh, one has to lead oneself in a in this new shift towards uh, uh, in the society at large. So I guess that, uh, you know, uh, my conclusion is foregone. I think this is uh, here to stay. It is going to go up uh, further. Uh, there are a lot of benefits uh, why a sharing economy has to be, you know, propagated into a, in a system where we are in, where, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, if I can link a little bit of on the, uh, the cost side of, you know, how you once manages. The ownership, to my understanding, is all about, you know, n not an authority, but it's more of a responsibility. And as well, uh, you know, accountability. So uh, when I see this way, and moving from, uh, you know, ownership to more of a sharing, I think uh, it changes the complete, you know, paradigm. 
So, and that's where we are in. And uh, as a business, uh, we are in a place where uh, we are in a space rather in the uh, in a telecom, where we give our entire infrastructure to all the competing forces in the market. So, I guess um, uh, the the benefits are immense. How uh, I can leave uh, you know with one thought here: uh, What is that benefit which all of us are taking? I'm sure all of us have got our mobile phones in our hands, right? Huh? So if you can go back and ask your parents that what was the cost of that uh, mobile phone on a monthly basis, uh, maybe 15 years before, that must have been close to around 300 bucks, right? Must be around 200, 250 rupees. Today, after 15, 20 years, you are still continuing to spend the same 250 bucks. So what is the um, what it says in terms of you know value creation uh, for an every individual? So. The consuming uh, individuals, or the consumers, or in this case, the customers or subscribers, are immensely benefited because of this you know, uh, system of you know, sharing. I think it is not only creates a value for the, uh, uh, the assets being unlocked for a value for the uh, uh, investing community, but also for the subscribers and the society as a large. So uh, my view is, yes, it has uh, started. Uh, we now start seeing those disruptive uh, uh, technology-wise and as well as, you know, the thought level-wise, there is a huge amount of, you know, a shift which has actually happened and is still happening, continue, will continue to happen. And um, as, a, as a society, I think now it's the time for us to adopt it and then start seeing how we um, actively engage with this uh, transition. Thank you so much. I think, uh, yes, you are already part of an industry where you are part of, you know, this shared economy. So thanks for your inputs out there. Uh, my request, Rajiv, uh, what are your take on this? Oh, that's the... Well, hi, my name is Navpreet Singh. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks for this opportunity. Well, sharing economy, the word says it all. Uh, in my opinion, very well said by uh, Balaji, sir. It is a moral responsibility. Being in an Indian culture, this is something which is given to us by birth. Share. Share, earn, deliver. Sharing is something which is inbuilt in us. When we grow, we tend to get into that fight of being a winner and going out of the crowd having an identity out of the crowd. However, the recent times has shown how sharing economy or the sharing, be it morally or responsibly, the industry is shifting. To name a few, uh, OLX, you are sharing somebody's used goods for your own purpose. You're testing it. Things are getting expensive, very, very expensive. You can't really get into something and say, it's a testing thing for me, let me test. So testing, the margin of error is very expensive. So anything that you find will be outdated tomorrow. You buy something today, will be outdated tomorrow. So platforms like eBay, OLX give you an opportunity to test something before you actually own it. Yes? You have Ola cabs, you have Uber cabs. Now, renting a cab to a destination as close as, say, 10 kilometers would shell out money worth, you know, 500 bucks, 600 bucks. But these share cabs actually take that part of money to other pockets as well. In fact, two of your Friends, in fact, you and your friend can actually travel on an expense of 50 bucks for the same distance if you share it. That's sharing. Morally, for the environment, you are carpooling today. You know, that's something which even the government, even the social organizations are emphasizing on. Carpool. Don't use your own cabs. Don't use your own cars. I was just reading a statistics that said, in a normal circumstance, 
nine, a car life, if you own a car, 95% of the time that car is unused. 95% of the lifetime of a vehicle is unused. That's a study. So today you have organizations like Zoom Car who are renting it to you. Take it, fuel it, return it. Use it as your own, you know, willing. So sharing economy is something which is the next thing. Not the next thing, but it is the thing today. And it would be emerging in a much bigger platform in the coming years. So we would be taking up some more questions from you. There are a lot of things to talk about it. This is an endless to topic. So I would not take much of your time. Uh, I would be ready for the questions that you have put across. And uh, accordingly, we'll talk it up. Right? Thank you so much. Thanks, Navdeep, for your thoughts on this. Uh, Raji? Uh, yeah. Now, a lot about the sharing economy, you know, the topic for today. Um, given your age, uh, you know, you are... You are part of it, you are living it. I think I can definitely speak for myself and some people on this panel. Most of us have, you know, did not see this at the time that we were entering the workforce. So I think you are all in a great place and likely have even better ideas than at least I will be able to share. So, you know, I think this panel discussion is as much for your benefit and as much I think I'll gain as much from it as you will. So I'm really looking forward to uh, list, you know, hearing your questions and the views of other panelists on, uh, you know, on this panel. Uh, it is a very interesting topic. Uh, let me try to take this into a slightly different area you know, compared to what Balaji and uh, Napreet um, took us in. Uh, let me first check how many people and be truthful, if you don't know the answer, just say no. How many of you know what Chrono says or does? Really, I see some hands up. Great, that's better than uh, how I, my knowledge before I entered, entered the company. So don't, don't feel embarrassed about if you do not know what Chrono says. I think it's important for me to tell you a little bit, uh, not because I'm plugging about the company, but I think it'll make more sense my comments will make more sense if you understand the context. So it's good that some of you know what it is. So Kronos actually just to, the easiest way to understand about the company is to think about the word Kronos. So Kronos is a Greek word. Does anyone know the meaning of Kronos? No? Okay, so got to do some more movie watching or whatever, uh, or reading. So Kronos means time. I think someone said it, so that's really great. Kronos is a Greek word for time. And uh, that was the origin of the company. It started out as uh, a time management company. It's a 40-year-old company, and uh, the owner and his brother, who are still involved in the company, actually went, you know, factory to factory selling clocks. They were selling time clocks. You know, the clocks that you may have seen, you know, workers punching in time. So that's what they used to do. Today, it's evolved into something very different because you know, economies, uh, businesses have become so much more complex. So let's take um, an example. Think of a hospital. Some of you may have visited there. Uh, you know, you may have had a relative or someone, or you may yourself have had a need to be in a hospital. So think of a hospital, you know, take any large hospital like Fortis or Max uh, or whatever. It, a usually a large super specialty hospital has somewhere close to about eight to 9,000 staff members. Doctors, nurses, ward boys, housekeeping, catering, and you know, some volunteers, and of course, you know, tons of visitors coming in and out. Most hospitals tend to have multiple entry points and multiple exits. So if you were responsible for running a hospital, and your job was not on the medical side, but in terms of managing the workforce, you have a very complex problem on your hand. You've got people who are full-time, part-time, doctors who, who come in only for two hours, nurses who have multiple different shifts, and you need some staffing ratios. You know, for an ICU, you need so many doctors, 
so many specialists, so many anesthesiologists, so many x-ray technicians, nurses, ward boys, and so on. And you've got this entire you know, building which is running with multiple specialities and people coming in and out. Now you could try to track it and whatever you may do, it starts becoming very complex because you know, an employee enters from a particular exit, uh, entry point, uh, after a few hours, let's say leaves, how do you get to know? Now you could try to put some time tracking, but how do you get to know when you need it? So if you have an operation scheduled at 4 p.m., if you start running around, you know, half an hour before and say, do I have enough nurses, ward boys, doctors, and this is x-ray technician, it'll become a nightmare. No hospital can run like that. And, you know, as you start multiplying that in terms of size, you realize that, uh, you know, businesses, uh, a hotel, uh, a factory, uh, you know, you take the Tata Steel factory in Jamshedpur or, you know, the Tata Motors factory or whatever, whichever ones you take, they are large, complex environments. And trying to manage them in a very traditional manner of supervisors tracking who is coming, who is going out, becomes very difficult. So what does all this have to do with sharing? Well, you know, as uh, organizations have become complex, so have individuals. So as you get into the workforce, and some of you may have already worked or so in your summer jobs, there are people who do part-time jobs. So you have a nurse who works for four hours in one hospital, three hours in another one. You have, you know, uh, retail clerks or you know, people who were you know, retail workers who are spending maybe you know, during Diwali time, they have to work 12 hours a day. Um, you know, so they have different shifts, they have different needs. They may have uh, you know, multiple jobs. And as you, know, as you see more and more younger people, they have needs which are not satisfied necessarily by just the part-time job that you have. So they may be doing two or three jobs at the same time. So uh, the needs of individuals have also become complex. And when you marry these two complex environments together, you start realizing that it's a very dynamic or organism which now needs to be managed. So that's what the product does, you know, the Kronos product. It helps you manage this complexity and manages a schedule. I mean, that's an easy one-liner about it. But you know, what does it mean about the sharing part? Well, this is where it's coming to. One of the things that we are increasingly being asked to work upon is that so far, you know, this was a kind of product that companies would buy. Companies would say, we need to schedule and manage and, you know, coordinate and manage our workforce. But increasingly, the employees are saying, you know what, I've got my mobile phone. You know, today I have some commitment, maybe there's a festival at home, maybe my child is not well, or maybe my parents have come to visit me. So instead of, you know, as a nurse, instead of starting my shift at 12, I'm gonna start my shift at two. Now you think about the consequent, consequential impact that can happen on the company. A traditional way, no large organization can manage that. And that's the sharing part that comes in because the minute you start saying, that I, as a resource, can decide my availability, whether I'm available at one particular time or another, or I need to make some changes to my, you know, my schedule. I need to take a day off which was not planned. And can I sh you know, swap my shift with biology? All of that you know, requires people to start looking at themselves as resources who can be moved around at their convenience and at the organization's convenience. And that's where I think eventually workforces are going to go, where people start giving out their services based on their own needs and on the needs available in the market. So you likely would have heard, you know, that if you wanted, uh, you know, to get some program written, you don't necessarily have to hire a programmer nowadays. You can go out, you know, on the web, and there are people who are willing to give their services for a few hours uh, and deliver the product that you want. In that environment, you know, you kind of 
start looking not as you know what uber or what ola and these companies are doing which is sharing uh, physical resources here you start sharing the you know the human resource that each of us have or the skill set that we have and we start selling it based on where the need is and i think that's where eventually societies will go because it creates flexibility for me as an individual and it creates more opportunity for me to earn and i think that's a dimension which you know is increasingly an important part of our economy and the underlying piece which i think we were discussing uh, after lunch today is what about data security because all of this requires individuals to give up a lot of information about themselves and i think during the rest of the time today this will be one of the topics that we'll debate because data security uh, is an important piece number of you may have read the newspapers recently one of the largest data uh, thefts that took place a few days ago equifax which lost you know millions uh, of employees worth of data uh, or or the consumers data you know those are kind of the challenges that each of us will have to start thinking about as we get more and more into the sharing economy that we're talking about so thank you joyita thank you rajiv for bringing in lot of those points uh, some points in which you know how chronos is really looking at uh, this kind of a shared economy and the various elements on how uh, the jobs workspace you know would also evolve you know uh, and moving in that direction so let me um, add up to you know some of those points uh, especially having uh, you know been part of olx uh, and being part of that shared economy in a very big manner so today you know even before i get started i mean today which is the biggest hospitality company that you all can think of airbnb does it own any you know buildings any stuff there is no infrastructure and similarly from fleet management point of view i mean these are all common examples but they are really i mean you know uh, big eye openers that you know they don't have their infrastructure they don't have anything yet they are making the most money and most of you would be dying to go and work for an organization like that which is done fantastic employer you know branding opportunities and new way of working right i mean many of you would be aspiring to work for them so uh, what now that that's the reality of today and in many sectors this is happening uh, faster we will come to that question that how it is going to impact some of the other sectors where we have not seen the entry as yet and hear views from the other panel members but uh, let me just come and talk about olx i mean you know the whole uh, um you know mission for the organization is building communities and build, build having win win exchanges when we say win win exchanges it is like you are winning as an individual because you are able to have access to some of the products or services which you could not afford in the past the fact of which enough enough pre brought about before as a student i mean you might be aspiring to have uh, you know one of the uh, latest models of iphone but maybe you know you will not have enough money to buy it right now but a couple of months down the line maybe someone who has bought it now would want to upgrade it to another uh, you know new phone which is coming in and you may be able to you know buy it at a much cheaper price and uh, when we say win win exchanges how does it happen is that someone who is selling a product is getting a very good value for money for selling an used goods and you on the other hand as the buyer is also getting it at a good price and uh, there are no most of the time there are no intermediaries in between because these are all done through a platform and it is very very convenient to do that um likewise you know you may have a used guitar or a used treadmill which is just lying you had a passion sometime and you went ahead and bought a guitar or a tennis racket thinking that one fine day i will go and use it and uh, but it's been lying there for a couple of months or years and you can really sell that and have a money to invest and buy something else which might be more meaningful for you so definitely from uh, you know commercial sense it makes sense uh, on the societal aspect as you said that you know it, it can give far more access to lot many more people to use better advanced stuff and also improve the carbon footprint because you're reusing the products and stuff um and uh, that is what 
you know uh, more and more uh, companies are going in for utilizing the resources there were a couple of examples with now free brought about and the example of indus towers is clearly that that how you are uh, sharing the available resources cost effective uh, in a cost effective manner um so how exactly i mean you know um we see this trend moving and coming to the other sectors is the next question that i would have uh, anyone is free to you know kind of uh, respond to that i'm just sharing my own personal view uh, you know it's uh, that, that's important at this moment to say um of course uh, no uh, our business is all about you know putting a physical infrastructure in place and uh, you know that is being shared uh we have moved from the state of ownership uh, you know culturally culturally i think uh, you know we have now currently start moving away from the typical you know the sense of ownership um uh, sense of ownership typically uh, attaches certain few uh, stigmas to it one is the cost one is the cost second is the cost of maintenance and the third is the underutilization of the asset uh, largely this uh, you know many other factors which are also influence this but then uh, these are all certain factors which we need to we would have to consider but the very fact that you know that we have moved away from the typical culture of being ownership uh now we start adopting the new things in terms of you know even uh, uh we talked about uh uber and uh, ola uh, which basically you can use those services and uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, have to own a car so uh when you start looking into this that anything and everything for that matter um Uh, which uh, which can be done now for example uh, you know which are all the stigmas which is generally we get attached to it in the in the process of you know owning an asset um uh, let's take a home example you now the example of uh, you know how a house has to look and as well as what type of furnitures we need to put and so on and so forth but then uh, when you start looking into it you know there is a problem statement which is actually you know evolving out of this uh when you see this uh, problem statement as a problem yes uh, you live within that then when you start looking at from a different uh, you know solutioning part and there exist companies which are actually start uh, you know coming up in uh, public space in terms of you know offering uh, you know hiring services hiring of uh, you know the furnitures and as well as you know readily usable uh, uh, uh utilities uh, for home uh so uh, you see you see how an industrial product for example uh, if i can just refer a concept of the sharing in one form or other it's actually you know started coming in uh, right from automotive sector and uh, as well a little bit uh, you know even beyond in an airline sector so when i say airline sector uh it's not only offering of the services to the uh, public in terms of you know selling the uh, uh, seats but also but also uh, at the maintenance levels now uh, ge is one company which actually started you know experimenting this uh you know for 15 20 years before if their revenues are x 0.8x that means 80% of their revenues is actually coming out of the products now if anyone have got an access to uh, you know see the balance sheet of uh, uh, ge the global company uh more than 80% is on the services now how the services is actually coming in one is the maintenance solutions which are given the second is nothing but today we call it as a sharing economy practices now how do they do that and that's a you know one of the best examples one one can actually you know would like to see and understand more precisely that how this you know business is actually moving in so if you see from a hardcore uh, you know heavy infrastructure companies which are actually moved into this kind of a uh, on this platform of sharing uh you also start seeing that you know, how an individual is actually making a preference in terms of not uh, wanting it but still you know enabling himself for all the services and facilities which are actually coming up 
both in terms of the physical car or uh, house, uh, you know, um, elements and so on and so forth. Now the third one, which probably can evolve and which is also evolving in about a, in the last a few years, is all about you know the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy is nothing but uh, you know it's not physical, it is not a contractual, but then uh, of course uh, you know, um, just now you have heard that uh, how. Uh, um, a programmer can be engaged for that four hours to get the um, uh, get your programming done. So I think uh, the the way forward, the way uh, which is which is already started uh, in one way or other, is the knowledge sharing. Uh, some of you must be familiar about you know Quera.com. Uh, how many of you are familiar? Many of you must be posting your questions there, right? And how quick you get your answers back? It's amazingly faster. You know, there are many solutions which are already predictive. I can tell you uh, one more example of you know, how this uh, you know, uh, economy is getting evolved. How many of you are familiar about you know, uh, Watson? Many hands are going up. What it does? It does, it does legal solutions for people who can't afford a legal, uh, uh, let's say, a lawyer. It does say predictive legal solutions for an individual who is, you know, uh, looking for a, uh, a solution for, uh, you know, under the legal platform. Now, how that has evolved over a period of time, and uh, this is where, you know, the heavy infrastructure companies which have actually moved into this kind of a platform, and those times we never used to work as a sharing economy. And then somewhere when it start hit, uh, you know, uh, being used by individuals in terms of their, you know, uh, uh, need-based uh, no requirements, then the, this became very, very eventual and it became very visible for each and every individual because it start affecting my life very favorably. The third is all about, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a knowledge economy. So when it comes to this, I think there's a whole lot of things which can actually, you know, play a plot. Not, I've given some few examples in terms of, you know, the legal framework and so on and so forth. The accounting jobs. Now the, uh, how many of you believe that, uh, you know, still a stenographer exists in the, uh, uh, as a profession? And that's already gone some 20 years before, 15 years before. When, when you start, you know, getting some applications which are actually, you know, start recording the words onto the uh, computer uh, uh, based on your, you know, verbal commands. Now, this is exactly where the predictive understanding, the predictive, uh, you know, uh, knowledge economy, which will actually carry over. And there exists a huge potential of this, you know, sharing economy uh, practices uh, getting evolved over a period of time. Uh, we've already seen that start. I guess uh, there's still you know, uh, miles to go there. And uh, that will probably bring, in those days, 20 years before, we used to say about you know, the global economy getting connected. Now that's a real connect which is going to happen. And that is what is, we are witnessing uh, in the last uh, few years and especially. And that is going to go on from here on. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add to that? Yeah. Uh, while I was hearing all of this, there were two things which came to my mind. One is, uh, we talk about goods and services, we all know. Uh, we've, we talked about hospitality, we talked about uh, cab services. There's one thing very, very commonly used. And correct me if I'm wrong, that could also be categorized into sharing economy, which is your food services. So. I think every day we use either Zomato or Fresco or Big Basket or Groffers. They are not product companies. They are not service. They are giving services for someone else, but they are giving you a platform to share responsibility. Today, I think uh, probably five years back, if you have to order something, you would order something nearby because either the uh, the restaurant would not deliver at your place or you'll have to go and buy, pick it up yourself. But now you just open an application, you have 
n number of options to choose from and you just give an order without even bothering who will bring it to you. Be it the restaurant which delivers it to you, be it some other vendor which delivers it to you. They are sharing the responsibility. They are delivering it to you together. And it is not charged on you. It is charged at the back end amongst themselves. They share it. So this is something which we are evolving into. Socially, I was just uh, sharing this with the panel uh, while we were having the lunch. Uh, I just got to know uh, some time back that there's a company which is coming up with a concept of sharing food. Anybody heard of it? No. So there's this uh, organization, there's a company, there's a restaurant which is coming up in Delhi right now and they plan to expand it to other cities in India. They have a very unique concept. Now, as I said, culturally, culturally we've been brought up in, uh, you know, joint families, we've been brought up sharing. But with time, we've all walked out of our natives. With, you know, professional responsibilities, we've come into nuclear setup, you know, friend circle has reduced, family members are all on social networking, we don't even get time to call them, right? So it's WhatsApp, good morning, finished. We don't even, you know, we just spoke in the morning. That's, that's how it is. So somehow or the other, as individuals, we feel that our circle, our social circle is reducing and world is also looking at the scarcity of food. Every day we hear you and send, there's a message which comes in that don't waste food, there's a number call when you have a party, if you have excess food, call this number and take the food away. Then they send you some pictures of people who are dying out of hunger. Now this company, what they'll do is, they have a food table. That food table says, if you want to eat something, and if the portion serves three or two, you are, you are alone. Now if you order something which serves two people, what, what happens? You end up eating your portion and wasting the other side. Yes? What they enable is, they enable you to invite somebody who's there and probably looking for the same order and together you order the same stuff, sit on the same table and pay together. Share the price. Thereby, socializing and reducing the wastage, which is very unique concept. Not services, not goods, but social. So they have a social message behind it. The motive is you get socialized, you increase your circle, you make friends if possible and you reduce the wastage of food. And very interestingly, this is the next step towards sharing economy. Isn't it? Yeah. I think some very valuable points which have come across and some new uh, industries, you know, which are coming up in this space because every other day we hear about some new space in which, you know, um, innovation around, you know, shared economy is coming up. I wanted to, you know, check on uh, some of the challenges which this industry is facing and do you see, you know, within India some kind of cultural in inhibitions playing some role here? What are your views here? Yep. Okay, great. I'm actually going to try to, the response I'm thinking of, um, addresses part of your first question and also this one. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, you originally asked about what other sectors do we see this coming in? To me, actually, that question is, um, is a little bit misleading because I, my view is that eventually everything that we do uh, is going to get impacted with the way what we are seeing in some of these examples that were being shared. These are the, you know, kind of the start of what is going to happen eventually to the entire economy. Uh, so we hear a lot about the gig economy and it's a, you know, commonly used phrase nowadays. You know, what it really means is the opportunity for us to be able to put out knowledge out there and figure out what is the best way to 
um, aggregate it and monetize it, which is what is happening in, you know, in terms of the economy. So Airbnb or Uber and so on, they're taking a service which traditionally was a single tenant service and now making it into an aggregated multi-tenant service. And the reason I say I think eventually all, all companies, the entire economy is going to get impacted with and you know move into the same direction is because you know you take currently the entire move towards the cloud. So companies are you know increasingly getting out of running their own IT, uh, you know having the traditional IT, you know their own servers and maintaining data centers and and managing it on their own, which was how traditionally most companies thought and knew that that was the way to do it. So in the last at least you know last decade or decade and a half the shift towards the cloud has become you know very rapid and companies are getting rid of their own data centers getting rid of their IT comp you know departments and saying you know I'm putting my information my knowledge base or you know whatever systems we have out there on the cloud now it started out initially as uh, single tenant clouds so if I you know, had something on the cloud as a company, it was basically whatever happened, it was any updates that happened were unique to me. Now, you know, in the last few years, as Google and Amazon have come out with their public cloud you know, offerings, what you're seeing is uh, companies going, shifting away from the single tenant cloud to multi-tenant cloud. And you know that has a big implication because now, if there is an ERP system, so let's say you're, you're likely all familiar with ERP systems, so you have you know an Oracle system that you have purchased. It's on a multi-tenant cloud. As Oracle comes out with updates, and you know the opportunity for all the companies is to come out rapidly with the updates every quarter or every you know every six months and so on. In a very traditional IT environment, you had bought a license, and as and when you decided to upgrade, you could move from whatever version to the latest version and keep up to date. In a single tenant cloud, you know you could still have the choice of saying, hey, these are the customizations I want, and this is the upgrade that I'm looking for. In a multi-tenant cloud, every customer, so if our company or any company has 100,000 customers, when they go in for an upgrade, all 100,000 customers get impacted at the same time. Now, and to me, that I think is the, you know, kind of the point on which we would start seeing that as you begin sharing resources and you realize that, you know, technology is going to enable you to parse resources not on individual basis, but on customizable basis. It will impact every possible thing that we can think of. And you know, uh, all these examples that are there on the, you know, in front of us and in the articles that your professors have kind of put together, they are the start of what's going to happen to every possible industry. So, I mean, an example uh, you know, I would give in as, as a reality check is, one of the companies I worked for was a general insurance company. And uh, we would have debates about you know, the kind of competition that was coming up. Traditionally, the competition was other general insurance companies. But you know, I left this organization about five years ago, so things have likely even evolved further. Five years ago, our assessment was, or you know, what we were, you know, some of the visionaries came in and told us that the biggest competitor for insurance companies is not going to be the banks, not going to be insurance companies, not retail, but Amazon, because their ability to come out and sell in a very different way. And if you think about it, Amazon is an aggregator, uh, you know, like Flipkart is, that they don't own any of those things, they don't make any of those things, and they are creating a, a platform without actually managing ownership of anything. So the impact of Share economy is going to come cut across uh, widely across the entire economy. Some sectors may take longer to get there, some you know faster, but it's going to happen to everything. 
you know, as far as the India piece goes, you know, uh, the second part of your question, Joyita, uh, you know, I think culturally, uh, and I think Navneet had mentioned it earlier, we are, you know, we are more accustomed to environments where you end up sharing resources. Part of it may be cultural, part of it may be that there used to be shortage of resources and we had to kind of make do and, you know, recycling was, uh, was you know, very common in India, you know, before it became fashionable, it was very common in India. So I think clearly, um, you know, aggregators would tend to find that it's easier to operate. Uh, I think our challenge is going to be government regulation um, because that becomes the bigger hurdle. And, you know, here is what I mean. I'll give you one example why I think government regulations can be a problem. So Uber, if you think about it, actually doesn't operate as a true aggregator in India. The concept of Uber when it first got launched in San Francisco you know, a number of years ago was that as the demand rises, private individuals could decide that it is economical for them to get out of their home, not watch TV or not be at home or do whatever, get out on the road and become a taxi driver, right? Ferry people and earn money. That's how the surge pricing concept came about, that as prices go up, you know, it attracts more and more taxi people to come inside and say, you know what, I can earn more money. Now, our regulations where, you know, you've got to have a separate license for running a taxi and so on, does not permit a private individual to say, okay, you know, I can see there is a great demand on Diwali night, let me get out, you know, and take my car out and use this, you know, uh, asset which is rusting and instead earn some money out of it. So, you know, that to me is a hurdle for an aggregator in the taxi business to be successful. And that's where I think our challenge will be, that our, our politicians and our government in India may be behind the curve in terms of letting this new energy in the industry, in the economy to, to be unleashed. Thanks, Rajiv. Um, here, I would like to add a few points around some of the hurdles that, you know, within India that we are facing uh, and some of the cultural inhibitions also, you know, with respect to the shared, part of the shared economy. So, uh, and I would, you know, kind of focus more towards the used goods segment, you know, which is where we have seen. So, if you have to buy a used car, you're pretty okay about it. If you have to buy a used mobile phone, you're still okay about it. Maybe a, a, a tennis racket or a cricket bat, you're still okay about it. But what about fashion and garments and things like that, which are very, very big segments globally? And they're very, uh, uh, you know, big numbers are there where people are pretty okay, uh, you know, selling their uh, branded stuff, which they would have bought at very high price and they've used it and then they don't want, want to use it anymore. So make some money out of it. There, what happens is there is not so much of concern around quality issues. Over here, when we try and, you know, look for those goods, the first question which buyers look for is, is this authentic Gucci? Is this authentic Prada, if at all you have those kind of stuff? And who is going to guarantee? So those are some of the other sectors which may, you know, which are likely to come up uh, that, you know, somebody who would be authenticating some of these products and, uh, you know, uh, saying that, yes, this is a certified Gucci or, you know, whatever. Uh, the other aspect is uh, in the whole aspect of trust. You know, when you're talking about platform uh, and we are uh, saying that someone, there's a buyer and a, a seller in, in the question, most of the time Indians want to see a particular thing, you know, and then buy. And that's, again, because of the quality aspect. And so how do you trust who is actually going to buy the stuff from you, you know, or whom are you going to sell the product? And that's where, you know, companies are trying to uh, use uh, their social profiling. And that's, again, where data is, you know, being shared very openly, um, you know, with other people and, uh, you know, to build trust aspect into the whole scheme of things. So uh, we see a lot of, uh, I would say, challenges still in this spectrum of trust, data, uh, you know, uh, sharing data very openly as uh, some of the aspects which still needs to be taken care of. And also the fact of uh, 
using some of these stuff which are considered more private to you than you know some of the other elements which might be commonly uh, used like you know if you have a newborn baby you would want everything new you would just not want to look at uh, you know something um, which has been used by anyone you would not uh, trust your child with that kind of hygiene and those kind of elements so uh, those are some of the aspects which we see as more of cultural barriers which are there but what we are seeing is uh, the millennials are uh, coming out of some of those mindsets it is uh, more to do with people still in their you know 30s who still have these kind of notions because that's what we have seen and we have grown up with that you know for such and such things you have to have a new product and a new stuff and but youngsters these days today i i know of some of the kids around you know the place where i stay they say we always buy from some of these sites online and we do get good stuff but that's a conscious decision that you know we want to save the environment we don't want to you know go towards it so uh, you guys the new generation you know are thinking you know much more consciously towards giving back to nature not really you know wasting resources and i think that would bring about a different kind of revolution in you know in in the whole concept of uh, shared um, economy um coming back to my question which i had asked was some of the other challenges that you know you're seeing in this sector and um, you know so if anybody can talk about it well the challenge is uh, like mr raj you just quoted everything is on cloud now by the way are you aware of cloud what is a cloud concept <laughs> wonderful i thought so so when the information is shared the privacy of your data gets very low very very low so the security personal security data security is at risk which also says that this concept could be put under a cushion is it really worth sharing a taxi with an unknown person is it really worth to shell out my information to a portal where i am booking my holiday and that portal gets hacked by a hacker and my information goes out and what the next next thing that i see is my money going out of my bank because my details were there i just booked my tickets so there is a huge risk involved in all of this however as i said every new thing which is being developed has risk pros and cons to it the risk of data and security personal as well is something that i think government is also working upon the developers are also working upon and they're making things more stringent for use in the future so that this gap is covered and people feel secure while using shared services or shared economy thank you so uh, then that brings uh, me to the next point is that what active role should the government play more and more towards you know bringing about more uh, regulations around you know some of these challenges that we are seeing today i just have uh, you know a couple of thoughts on the reflections uh, uh, what you just now as well as uh, rajiv you have shared uh, one of the big risks uh, in this entire sharing economy is also about you know the risk of reputation because you uh, reputation uh, you know drives the trust and it connects two strangers uh, in terms of the company and the user and uh, need not necessarily the uh, uh, the uh, two strangers have to meet um, so so the risk of reputation is a fairly a large one the assessed risk uh, you know we have heard many stories you know elsewhere in you know, delhi or could be bangalore um, uh, in an incident which is an untoward which has happened with uh, one of the uh, you know in a car uh, you know the paper comes with a newspaper saying that you know the ola driver or the uber driver or uh, you know xyz uh, company guy uh, who did not uh, follow the norms and practices or the framework which is actually put in for a serviceability at a specific you know uh, uh, on a inside a house or a private location 
Now, what happens is that, uh, you know, the reputation risk is fairly large. The, the perceived risk in, uh, on the uh, reputation is completely uh, not a measurable one. It uh, erodes in no minute of time. Uh, the huge business which is, you know, painstakingly developed uh, over a period of time, where in one single of act, one single act will bring down the entire system down. Now, uh, that brings to the second, uh, you know, challenge of the question which we have in terms of, you know, whether the government, uh, and what is the role of the government? Now, um, I think we need to uh, have a little bit, you know, step back on our time, uh, you know, pre-sharing pre economy era. And uh, even today, for that matter, uh, you know, there's always a reference why uh, search pricing was uh, not allowed in the uh, state of Delhi or the city of Delhi. Um, and there was a research done, uh, both by the government agencies and as well as with the private, uh, you know, uh, 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 research companies, uh, which has actually ended up work, only to find out that uh, who are the possible, uh, you know, the user community of these vehicles. I'm just taking an example of uh, why, what is the role of the government, uh, to explain what is the role of the government. So now, who are the possible users of this, you uh, know, facilities or the uh, sharing economy? And then they came up with a very, very startling, uh, you know, revelation. The revelation is that, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the, uh, you know, the users are typically lower in the sense middle class or just above the uh, poverty line uh, band of people. Now, uh, with a, with a, you know, um, uh, how many of you knows that uh, India has adopted the directive principles of state policy? Huh? And it's not today, yesterday, it's close to, you know, 65, 70 years before, right? So now, have we really dispensed with? No. We still continue to spend money from government, uh, by government, for the welfare of the uh, people. Um, we cross-subsidize many things. We still have a dependency in terms of, you know, what government has to do uh, when it comes to those, you know, strata of population, which is largely dependent on, uh, you know, various... Uh, subsidies and, you know, funding mechanisms, what uh, the government has. Now, who uses this sharing economy, uh, uh, you know, outputs or the services or the benefits which are, you know, uh, supposed to be thrown? Is all those, you know, band of people who generally cannot at this moment afford it. They're a very small, uh, not so significant, but a small proportion of population, which basically moves into this uh, sharing economy purely based on the advantage which was, you know, stated under this, you know, uh, in this business or a, in the sharing economy business. So the question here is that, you know, what is the role of the government in terms of, you know, given the uh, current, you know, uh, the profiling of the users of this uh, platform? When I, uh, when I see the incidents and as well as, uh, you know, uh, um, the kind of uh, dependencies where this uh, set of population which is actually using these uh, platforms. There is always a need for, you know, there is always a need which is actually uh, requires a regulation to be uh, put in. So let's say middle of the night, you know, uh, same, back to the same example of Ola or Uber. You get their services 24 by 7. You get your services in the middle of the night, and you get down to the airport at two o'clock in the night, and which is uh, you know just one hour you need to travel back to your home. Uh, probably you don't use your own car. Uh, probably you ask uh, you know book your Ola or Uber in the uh, uh, airport. Now. What is the risk which we are, of course, we talked about data security. Now here, this one hour of travel, what is the level of risk that you are with uh, when there is virtually no regulation in place? So regulation probably is a debatable one, whether to what extent of regulation which is required. Now, government's policy is always to protect the citizenship, to keep their tranquility, peace, and so on and so forth, ensure law and order, and so on and so forth. Everything has to be given. There's no compromise on that. So now, to what extent the government has to frame those policies in place? 
not compromising uh, you know those stated values which they are supposed to uh, for which uh, you know uh, and to what extent you know there has to be a de-licensing mechanism or the uh, de-engagement disengagement mechanism which needs to be arrived at. Now I'll just give some quick example on you know, how a telecom companies actually work. So now uh, if you go back 20 years before, uh, you know, there's a heavy licensing regime and uh, it used to be even today, uh, there is, you know, too much of compliances and licensing one has to do. But is it the same, uh, you know, the practices what uh, we adopted or we are supposed to adopt in 1995 till 2015 in the last 30 years? Probably no. In the last 20 years, you know, things have moved uh, f uh, fairly along. Uh, I should say that if not 360 degrees, at least 270 degrees. But yet, there are compliances. Yet there are practices which are which needs to be abided. Uh, I think uh, uh, telecom professionals or budding professionals are there. You all familiar about lawful intercept, right? How many of you are familiar about lawful intercept? How many of you believe that your phone is very, very secure? Now connect my word of lawful intercept with your phone security. Now when I use the word lawful intercept, it's all about, you know, interception is, is, is a taboo, is wrong. But if it is a lawful intercept, for what purpose? For the, you know, national security, for the, you know, peace and stability. If there are reasons for, you know, attributable, uh, for any, any, uh, any of such reasons, I think, uh, you know, uh, a lawful intercept is, is a, is a, you know, uh, norms of the government. So the uh, investigating officers can actually barge into the system and then, uh, you know, look for records of the CDRs. So, you're all, some of you must be familiar with the CDRs, right? It's a data recorder. So, they can, you know, seek those CDRs to see whether, you know, to what extent and what was the conversation between two individuals on a phone. Now, this is called lawful intercept. Suppose, assume for time being, there is no policy, uh, which probably makes this uh, uh, investigating agencies uh, not to have this interception. Now, what happens to you? The basic tenet of this safety and security, peace or tranquility, which needs to be maintained by, uh, you know, various uh, government agencies for the uh, state of the welfare of the people, probably cannot be fully assured of. So this is very debatable. But the question what we are sitting with is that to whether the government uh, has to do or not to do. Instead, uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's my view that to what extent the government has to do. So given the economic framework, the people or the strata of the uh, population, how many are actually using this? To what extent, you know, that needs to be? And when is the time when the government actually have to move away? For example, that we talked about, you know, state policy, right? Uh, directive principles of state policy. This is nothing but the government will invest money in factories, which is nothing but your PSUs. Now, just a week before that, you heard that there are some PSUs which have been identified for a monetization. When I say monetization, so now they are looking for appointing advisors to give the valuation for those companies to be sold. Now, we still continue to be under the, you know, these principles of state policy. But however, there is a time where there has to be uh, you know, engagement by the government and government takes a call at an appropriate moment at a time when they need to go back to their barracks. And that's how it is. So the question is that to what extent, you know, uh, they need to advise, devise. At the same time, at what point in time they should withdraw. And to the withdrawal mechanism has to be very clear. So there has to be a framework. And that's what I believe. And I've come from those industries where I've actually worked. Um, uh, which actually, how do I say, uh, we use a very favorite term called a license raj. You know, uh, I've started my career during that time. So uh, I also know the benefits of, you know, when there is no license, what happens? That your market becomes free. The free market is nothing but the perfect markets. Are you familiar with perfect market? 
anyone can come anyone can go right investments are free at the most competitive pricing so the perfect market mechanisms can be only applied at a time when uh, you know there is a, uh, a reasonable regulation in place because it protects the society it protects the investor it protects the entire you know economic system as a whole also this is this is my view anyone else wants to add yeah i you know i would like to actually build on what balaji is saying uh, but i have a slightly different take on it i think the role of government is needs to be to ensure that there is a level playing field and that the playing field is monitored properly but trying to decide winners and losers which is what a lot of our government does you know and giving licenses not giving licenses controlling you know spectrum or whatever it may be i think creates challenges because it leads to bias it leads to political influence and leads to corruption all of those which we are very familiar in our country i mean india is has got is the most regulated country in the world although the implementation of laws is so weak that it seems like it's a free for all so we have a regulation for everything there is nothing that you can do which is not regulated in some fashion by some law in our country you know i my view you know is that I, what we need the government to do is to think ahead about what kind of economy we want to create if we want to be part of this gig economy and you know become a more technological superpower that we aspire to be there is you know what the government needs to do is create a level playing field ensure that that playing field is managed well and regulated well and then get out of the way because by being in the middle of it they suck up resources and create barriers to you know to growth and employment opportunities so you know th that's a take i would see i think they have a role to play in ensuring there is trust that the rule of law is followed that contracts are honored there is no dishonesty in terms of you know the kind of products being sold or fraud you know being conducted those are things which the government needs to invest in not try to you know actually run industries or favor some some industrialist over others you know which is what lot of our government regulation seems to do so uh, you know similar to you know it's building on what balaji said i think the government needs to redefine its role than what it has been doing so far i think they will uh, mention by both of you balaji and rajiv that you know there is a requirement but to what extent and where it is and also for everybody to understand interpret it and uh, then use it because most of the time in india we see that yes there are too many rules but we are really bad in you know seeing it through and uh, one of the examples which i want to quote basis my you know experience of working uh, in uh, one of these new age industries is that cyber laws cyber crime you know like people, first of all there is very little awareness of it like where all you can use this even the people who are responsible to you know um upkeep of the rules and the laws they themselves don't know you know where to draw the line and how to help so that's where like companies like us we are spending lot of time to um, educate even people from the police authorities and other you know places that this is how it needs to be seen these are the various challenges which we hear from you know consumers proactively so that they are equipped and they can within themselves you know also decide and uh, you know keep their teams informed that okay if you get a complaint like this this is how you are supposed to you know treat and act on it because as we said the rules have been made but you know how the whole thing needs to be interpreted and uh, followed is still you know a very very big challenge for someone you know uh, you know in in the let's say the police department or some of the other authorities you know their knowledge of the digital uh, india is so limited that i think that's that's one place where you know i think uh, bringing everybody to a given level you know is a big role that the government has at this point in time there are various initiatives which have been done so i think once this the stage is set and you know people are really you know walking the path in that 
I think then we'll be far more ready than you know where we are today. Um, keeping uh, time into consideration, I was uh, um, in fact you know wanting to move to another dimension of it very quickly that we've talked about the industry, the opportunities, challenges and all of it. But now I want to, you know, kind of uh, hear from uh, views from some of you about, uh, you know, what it takes to be part of this industry. What are the competencies that you see would be really important? What are the differences in mindset and attitudes which people have to demonstrate to uh, be successful? Uh, you know, to be part of this new way of working. You know, so, uh, who would like to go first on this? Yes, the competencies are changing. While, uh, from an uh, from a recruiter's point of view, from an HR point of view, if I were to talk about, uh, if for a certain job we were looking at somebody uh, who had hunger to succeed as a competency, somebody who wants to succeed, somebody wants, who has his perseverance skills. Somebody who perceives his, his uh, selling skills too much, somebody in sales, who acts as an individual contributor, this might move into focused on results. At the end of the day, what is your target? Your target is X revenue. So the competency might move from a high weightage of hunger to succeed to focus on result. So the competency Ill will shift from an individual point of view from A to B. And that's where uh, a group would be more important. It will be important to work in a team rather than individually. Sharing responsibility. How well can you share responsibility? So with time, when we look into uh, su successful teams, successful people. Now people are successful not only because they were really good, but they had good people in their team to work with them. Yes? So how many of you play sports? Wonderful. Do I need to relate this to sports? Yes? So, do I need to relate it or is it self-explanatory? Right? So, it is there. An individual cannot win the match for you. It is the team sharing. How well do you share responsibility? How well do you partner with your player? Of course, if you're playing this one-on-one, that's a different thing. You can't really have. But then again, on one-on-one also, how well does your coach share his ideas and his strategy with you? So, if the coach does not guide you well, you would not be able to beat the other person because you would not know what are the weaknesses or the strong points of the opponent. So it's important, very important to share ideas, to share responsibility. And that's where the competencies play a very, very important role. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually am going to just build on some things that he said in there. You know, he covered a number of great points. Uh, you know, the way I would like you to think about it is what kind of companies would succeed in, in the kind of uh, environment we are talking about. So you're talking about companies which are going to be fast, uh, they're going to experiment a lot, um, they will have failures, and they will quickly rebound from those failures. Uh, you know, they, they will, in, you know, they would invite people who have deep specializations in the kind of uh, technology or the work that they're doing who would come together, work rapidly together, and then move on to something else. If those are the kind of businesses and you know, uh, organizations that are going to get created, the kind of competencies that we would need would be very similar. Uh, we would need people like Namdi said, who are team players, who collaborate well, who have deep knowledge and are not in it because there is a title involved or there is a bigger you know, office involved, but because that they can contribute to that project or that initiative and deliver, get success. Maybe it's a failure, but they learn from it. So, you know, the ability to rebound from that failure rapidly rather than getting, you know, caught up in what happened and, and so on, I think is, is, those are the kind of competencies that will become increasingly important. So some of the things that will go away 
are things like people who you know hankering after titles bigger offices uh you know tenure uh, those are things that are not going to be important things that are going to be important are the skill set you bring in terms of working with others working in a diverse environment working remotely working with teams which are spread across the globe and are able to manage yourself and you know the work with other people uh, in those teams so i think those are the skill set that will become increasingly more important uh, and you are already seeing that in a lot of new technology companies but it will happen across the industry at least that's you know that's our reading of the kind of people that we are seeing who are you know more and more successful in their in their work uh, maybe then i would like to add up few things very 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 relevant that you know collaboration team work uh, beyond boundaries those are there uh, speed agility you know uh, are very important aspects in today's world uh, when we see agility it comes to you know your agility to learn new things so continuous learning i think is very um in fact um, you know the way you know the disruptions are happening today in scenario unless you are really having a change mindset quickly you know kind of uh, very very vigilant about what is happening around uh, reading uh, continuously trying to see whether you fit in what else do you need to you know kind of build your experience is your hand for you know asking for new projects so redundant those will be very important so you know learning which or uh, whichever uh, stage of career you are in i mean of course if you are students right now it will be very relevant for you to see that you know uh, how are you different from you know some of your friends sitting here you know or next to you in the room because the competition is very steep so obviously on one hand we are saying team work yes team work is important but at this point in time how do you stand out from others will be an important aspect and likewise as you progress in your career what value you're bringing on table is very important and how you're going to continuously you know manage and sustain that is the kind of learning that you're doing on your own a lot of times you know we have these questions coming in uh, you know being custodians of people in the organizations is what is the company doing for us yes of course the company will you know will be doing a lot in terms of you know learning interventions and uh, you know uh, supporting you know the career uh, uh, paths and choices for people but what we go back and say is that you will also have to do equal amount or much more to build your own career and i think uh, you know that will be very important uh, you know what skills are applicable today may or may not you know be there you know in the times to come who knew about big data in the past nobody right and today you cannot you know do without that um, many of you sitting here in the room may not be really liking maths analytics and stuff like that but whether you like it or not guys please brush up your skills on that area because every day respective of whether you are a marketing guy or a finance guy or an hr or an operations guy data back decision making is the word and it is the way to go right now so uh, that is one area uh, you need to kind of focus upon ability to see ahead of the curve very important you know um earlier we used to talk about uh, okay business cycles uh, which are fairly longish one year plan three years plan five year plan which in some of the industries are still very relevant uh, given the nature of business but for a lot of these new age companies it is three months plan or six months and do we really call them plan they are like operating rhythms you know or models you know things so that has become a reality so uh, constantly changing learning innovating ability to take risks uh, your entrepreneurial spirits all of that are the newer competencies that will be far more you know acknowledged and relevant you know in times to come apart from obviously the other uh, time tested ones like you know rigor and discipline and uh, your basic integrity and uh, you know strategic orientation and all of that so 
those are given they are going to stay but some of these other ones that you heard today are going to be you know uh, the ones which will be distinguishing um, you know uh, one from the other or successful organizations than the others now um you guys have been listening quite a bit and uh, in a very comfortable position and making us uh, you know take all the trouble of you know using our mental agility and bringing about all our learnings into uh, you know the last one and a half hours now let's reverse roles and let's come back to you so you have uh, all the time uh, i would say the next 45 minutes at least uh, to ask us questions so we have some work for you and uh, um, keep us occupied now so who goes first do we have some mics amongst the audience okay so very good afternoon to all your dignitaries i have two questions uh, first one to uh, rajiv sir uh, so like you briefed on uh, how government can take step for getting us into you know geek economy so uh, i just want you to tell us how we as beginners uh, we are going to enter in corporate can do or can uh, take step for getting us into uh, gig economy you know what i would like to suggest is you know irrespective of the field that you are in i think the important part is that you um, you know spend time understanding the business uh, so wherever whichever company whichever industry that you get in getting to know the business irrespective of the role you have or the level you are in is one of the most important pieces uh, all of us have a bias for action you know we get into a job or we get into a project you know monday morning all of us will be at work you know the bias is okay let's jump into something and do whatever is the need of the hour there is some fire burning or there is some work to do a lot of times what we don't do enough of is understanding uh you know the full perspective around it planning it better and that's the advice that i would have you know get to know your company get to know the business get to know the industry uh, learn to use data because that's very important a lot of times you get caught up into situations about well he said or she said or this is what i found out from you know talking to two or three people i think till you have data and you are able to use it well it you know your knowledge is not sufficient so you know those are you know two very important aspects the other you know the competencies and all i think we spoke a lot about you know the agility part and the flexibility and the teamwork part i think those are important uh, on an individual basis you know some of the things that i wish i knew was i mean i i can share that is very important to get you know to learn to work within a team so as as students unfortunately we are taught you know that you have your own marks and your own standing in the class and you have your own report card it is all about what i did so we sit in an interview this is what i did this is what i did this is what i did there are very few companies where an individual is doing something on his or her own you are always working part of a team and the more you can collaborate with others you know the more success you will eventually have so in some ways you have to give up the concept that education teaches you which is you know this is about your scorecard and how you did as an individual because that increasingly doesn't matter what matters is are you able to work with others and deliver something far better for the company so thank you sir add to that please because yes, sure, um, sure. you know whatever rajiv said definitely are very important but you know today um, some of the other things by way of which you can have your edge is to depending upon which function let's say if you are a marketing person or an hr person or business side please figure out the new uh, you know the new models the new technology which is being used and all of that very very you know deeply and thoroughly there's so much of you know reading material which is available case studies which are available so that you know that's your edge that what is the latest which is happening in that space uh, and being aware of it you know with examples relevant examples 
is going to really help you you know and uh, in case you have opportunities to do internships and projects at any point in time I really I mean don't know uh, if pick up those projects with great thought you know so that you get good uh, you know experience during those months because those are the play the kind of questions which we as recruiters can ask you, you know, when we are interviewing freshers, that what have you done, what have you seen, and you know, have you just used those two months just to, you know, while away your time, uh, or you have used it wisely and picking up things, you know, from whichever company or industry that you have worked in. Um, so, and and the right attitude, as we said, to learn, uh, not to be bothered about titles or the kind of money that you're making initially. Um, because uh, th you know that that that's the way. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I have one more question uh, to you. Uh, like uh, people uh, in some cases usually does not prefer to you know uh, buy old things. Uh, so being in OLX, uh, the strategies. What are the strategies you're following? Uh, like uh, for what uh, you know uh, your company is uh, going into a success. Sure. So uh, you all would have seen OLX ads. They've been very popular yes, in the last yes, few years. How many of you have seen OLX ads? All of you, right? I mean, so there are a lot of ads like our brand building strategy over the last many years was largely targeted around changing the consumer behavior and consumer mindset to use used goods and to say that it's cool, it is okay. Or, uh, you know, uh, things like how you you know if you're able to buy and sell used goods you can you know have better purchasing power to you know uh, work so there's been a lot of work where we are working to you know uh, resolve this whole issue around a consumer mindset um, and as we said that along with the mindset there are various other issues around trust factors and uh, which is where we are working with the regulatory bodies um, and uh, you know so that that's how to through brand building activities we are trying to do it in a big way as employees you know one of the biggest values that we are expected to demonstrate is a value called live it which means are you really using the app are you use actually you know buying and selling used goods yourself and if you have done what are your you know experiences in doing that put it in a platform we have an in internal platform talk about it what it does is that one I mean, you know, what we are expecting others to do around us, are we really practicing it? When we do it and we share our experiences internally amongst other employees or back at our home or amongst our friends, you know, um, you know that that's how we are kind of conveying messages and saying that we believe in it this is how we have benefited it's very easy to do give feedback about our app and our product or the customer challenges to the internal teams to make improvements and you know so it's it's like a continuous process right and and we we, we would be very happy if we let's say if you have i mean i know of um, my kid who had an xbox and he wanted to sell it and he did it was just lying aside and he wanted to buy some you know some more additionals for his camera and i was not willing to fund for it because he, i didn't know how much he was using his dslr you know to what extent so he sold his xbox and the kind of money he made he didn't even expect that much of money to be made and and then he went about talking to some of his other friends and uh, now that you know when he's asking me to get him a bike he's saying it's okay mom i can really live with a second hand bike but i want this model you know kind of stuff so this kind of experience sharing really helps us uh, to kind of change the kind of old traditional you know mindset that we have Want to add something to that? so this was specifically to OLX but uh, having said everything so for two hours we've been talking about uh, used goods we've been talking about services sharing services but this very very important thing that we've all been part of ever since Ever since. Any idea what? For all of the things that we've talked about, what do you need? Money? You all have bank accounts? Yes, sir. So you all deposit money there? Yes? You deposit and withdraw, both. 
Yes? So now, Sorry? Now we're just getting it is income. used for economic growth. The taxes that you pay, you are contributing, you are sharing, you are sharing your money with the government, you are paying taxes. Financial institutions, I come from a financial institution, I come from an NBFC, non-banking financial company. Your education loans, house loans, any consumer loans, aren't the financial institution sharing the risk with you? Yes? So if you don't have enough money, there are financial institutions to institutions to offer you that amount of money that you're f falling short of. Isn't it? Now, if I talk about specifically Home Credit India, the concept when I joined here was very unique to me. In order to apply a loan, what do you need? What does the company first ask you to do? Sybil check. Yes? When do you get a Sybil? You get a Sybil report when you have taken a loan previously, you're eligible for that kind of a amount. If you have that repayment ability, isn't it? But if you don't have a Sybil account, does it entitle you for a loan as a fresher with as a as an individual? Probably not. Yes? Whereas Home Credit India, primarily the concept was it used to give loans, it does give loan to the first time users. Small ticket size, it was a small ticket size. And it was targeting masses. It was unique in its segment. And I think that concept enabled the company to actually get the ground. And slowly the other financial institutions also followed it. And that's when the competition comes into picture. So you are sharing, in other words, you are enabling an individual to upscale himself or herself in the economy by getting a civil record and then getting eligible for a higher ticket amount, higher loans, heavier repayment options. Yes? So this is something that we all are being part of. We've been brought up like that. Be it barter system, we were talking about, we're sharing stuff. So it's ever since you know, we can think of, we've been part of this economy. It's just that it is evolving now. The concept is still there. Yes? We have a question there. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, respected panel members. I am Karthik Pandey from BIB Marketing. I have two questions to ask you. My first question is, often in the sharing economy, uh, the platform business providers are accused of uh, that they take a larger amount of chunk from the service providers, uh, uh, from the uh, profit that they earn. I would like to draw your attention towards uh, the recent strikes that were happening in uh, New Delhi and Bangalore uh, by Ola, Ola and Uber drivers, uh, where they accused these service providers of uh, uh, cutting in their commission. So what's the way out in that case? And my second question is that uh, in context with replacing the traditional economy with the sharing economy in India and uh, the specifically for uh, when it comes to stability where stability in job is still considered as a crucial factors uh, uh, in the minds of Indians. So your views on that. The first question. Okay. Uh, I think I understood the first question so I'll answer that. Maybe you can repeat the second question later. Uh, you know, your, con your, your proposition that, uh, you know, the controversy, you know, that was being raised that are, are the aggregators taking a higher rate, a higher commission from the providers and, you know, is it unfair? I think to me the solution, so without getting into the merits of the case because I don't know enough about the merits of the actual case to say whether they were right or wrong. I think to me the real solution to that is more competition, not less, not regulation, because that's where the government starts getting into and trying to say this is the rate that you can charge or this is the commission you can charge or not charge. And I think that distorts the market. 
what you need then is you know what is it, what exactly happened in the telecom industry you know greater competition leads to prices being controlled and managed because the right kind of provider at the right price wins and that's what eventually benefits the consumers you know these all these services are driven towards having uh, the consumer getting a service at a better service than the he used to have at a better price that he used to have and the way to do that is by increasing competition so there are going to be aberrations there are going to be companies which will try to do the wrong thing i don't know in this particular case they were right or wrong that's irrelevant but in any industry there are companies which are going to try to do you know try to do price gouging or whatever it may be but eventually you know the way to control that is by having a market which is enabling sufficient competition on a level playing field so others can enter in and bring the prices down and the quality up yeah um i couldn't understand your second question so i can't um, could i add on to the first question if that's okay all right so uh, while rajiv i mean uh, the points which you shared is definitely very relevant to one class of the shared economy that you have mentioned about you know um uh, like having more competition and stuff like that but for a lot of these e-commerce internet based companies if you have to say to take very specific example of ola or uber i mean they were subsidizing you know the costs hugely is that the cost at which they can really sustain for a very long period of time the kind of discounts that you see in flipkart or amazon that's still debatable you know because uh, most of these companies i mean are they really actually making money and how long they can continue with these kind of subsidies is to be seen and and some of these uh, issues about the strikes was about taking away the subsidy from the drivers right that was the issue that's the way to get on the consumers hooked on to you know a cab facility and service and that ac environment and once you get hooked on to it then who is in the long haul and somebody who is who has deep pockets to be able to kind of sustain the long haul are the ones who are going to stay so for some of these kind of industry specifically i would say that the winner takes it all so you would only have one or two top winners who are going to be there all others the very small players you would see that is what is happening today is uh, Uh, they are either disappearing or uh, they are uh, there are those mergers which are happening around so for this segment uh, this is how it is you know kind of working as of now what was your second question um uh, often in, in many articles i have read this thing that the critics of shared economy Uh, accuse this economy that it cannot replace the mainstream job structures It means if a legal consultant is uh, actually giving its services on some uh, uh, some online platform so uh, he cannot actually sees uh, doing the job which he exactly doing physically or where the firm for which for which it uh, he is working so uh, in that case how stable this this economy is when it comes to the traditional jobs where there are leaves sick pays and bonuses and all these uh, things which are involved okay so you're talking about job stability in the new age industry so to say right that's your question see um the the level of disruption for some of these new age industries is far faster than some of the traditional ones but having said that if you're looking at marketing right and take whichever industry that you want to really take is marketing really happening in the same way that it was happening till few years back let's say even the fmcg companies or the telecom companies or any of the new age industries everything has really changed right i mean and the skill sets like today digital marketing skill is something which is very very relevant content marketing has become the backbone of you know the uh, the brand part of it right so uh, so be it the new age or uh, some of the traditional companies the way of working um, is changing you know in both the pace of change is far faster in the other places what we are saying is lot of you know uh, new companies which had mushroomed 
purely you know and they were highly getting valued and stuff like that and which was not really sustainable so many of them have actually you know kind of ceased to exist now and unfortunately the jobs have gone but uh, if you think that you know things are going to remain the same way for some of the traditional companies then we are all sadly mistaken and there are multiple you know uh, news items and reports which are coming across across industries i mean we really look at telecom sector i mean you know i've been part of the sector uh, myself and i have seen that how you know uh, you know the whole situation is completely changed in this sector or the pharma sector which was known to be such a stable sector till some time back they are also seeing lot of trouble so uh, you have to be very careful in choosing the job uh, what you want to do at times you know we are also aware that getting your first job you don't have too much of choice so you have to be realistic that you know uh, today there are not too many companies hiring too many freshers so uh, do that selection right but uh, keep your learnings intact whatever opportunities whichever company you join you know the moment you join please try and get involved and engaged in various different kind of projects depending upon your area of interest where you know you see that you know the business is likely to grow and you know the focus area um take initiative and continue with your learning because that is the only way in which you know you can uh, kind of stay afloat and uh, reskilling just be absolutely prepared to reskill yourself at any stage of life because that is again becoming a reality that you know today we, we may have a particular role which may need us to have particular skills but tomorrow we really don't know if that job is going to be there in the same shape and form right good evening ma'am hello uh, towards the right yeah. uh, ma'am my name is harsh gupta and i am from finance batch um my question to all of you is uh, you all discussed about the uh, share economy and uh, the various sectors which will be coming in the share economy i want to know like uh, what is the uh, impact on agricultural sector like uh, will it be a part of the share economy in future or not and if yes then how you know actually you opened a completely new thought in the, in my mind right there. so uh, first of all is a good question in one way or other because um, you know our economy still believes yeah? in indian economic system still believes that uh, agriculture is going to play a huge part despite the fact that is uh, you know good amount of uh, uh you know contribution by both industry and as well as services and um, i would say we just to have the reference or relevance between you know what happened in the united states of america which is supposed to be the the richest and the best and uh, you know technologically uh, heavily oriented uh, you know uh, country in that way compared to an indian system uh start comparing both the and you are from finance so probably you know i have a little bit more liberty to say that you know your number speaks in front of you right so uh 4% of population uh, which is roughly around you know 10% of the land base compared to indian agricultural land base with almost like um, you know one third of their uh, uh, uh gdp in terms of uh, you know uh, measure is coming from agri but as well compared to the indian standards uh you know when i say 10% of the land base that means you know uh, i will leave it to your mathematics in terms of you know how that uh, size is going to be and the population we all know that close to around 70% still believes that uh, you know the agriculture is the way of life now uh, when you put these two paradigms into two uh, you know extreme corners of the uh, graph and you will see whether how that is actually moving the move is purely you know purely from a you will find the reasons on three blocks one is you know it's a heavily oriented on a technology base second is knowledge and the knowledge probably gives some kind of a productiveness in the system now you see this uh, you know these three blocks which actually made them to move away from less dependency in terms of people equal or more or less similar weightage in terms of their gdps 
and as well uh, with a new uh, you know hybrid uh, uh, technical practices which they actually not follow so how they have gone one of the research which basically suggests that you know, it is not only these three but in terms of their you know uh, knowledge economy uh, on to the agriculture how they share now when you when you see that and when when india for all practical reasons is going to have you know 1.3 billion population in a, or 1.5 billion population in another you know uh, few decades is going to be a major enabler in terms of you know the uh, uh, in this knowledge space so it, you will see this change coming in shortly now the policies or the government policies or uh, you know uh, are not that favorable at this juncture but however in the last few years you would have seen that you know the administered pricing policy has been changed has not only brought in you know certain controlled uh, you know pricing mechanisms to uh, you know uh, on on the few uh, uh, cash crops per se and as well now uh, you know the kind of um, impetus which is given uh, uh, right from you know uh, contract forming this is something new uh, to indian system which will make uh, the land tillable and usable for almost like you know 365 days in a year so these things are not going to be enabled unless otherwise they bring the basic tenet of sharing uh, in terms of practice so uh, the policies are currently not that you know very explicit but i guess they given the current scenario and in terms of you know the push on uh, globalization because you must have been watching about you know what happens in the gat negotiations and so on and so forth so eventually india has to play a huge part in terms of you know how they synchronize and integrate uh, to the uh, entire value chain uh, on a overall global economy so uh, it is going to happen so you see those changes coming in trickles but then these changes is eventually get you know mobilized uh, over a period of time and that over a period of time can be anybody's guess it could be 3 years it could be 5 years but point is here that uh, you know directionally you are there it's a question of traction how government wants to take it and how the people like you all uh, uh, would like to take agriculture as an engineering agriculture as a business uh, which is uh, which will change the entire paradigm thank you sir good evening panel members my question is to uh, rajiv sir so don't you think uh, government should sell off all its operating uh, businesses to private sectors and uh, have a administered uh, uh, policies so that there shouldn't be any monopoly in the private business and uh, government should solely uh, look into the welfare of the public rather than uh, rather than running its uh, debt businesses or funding its debt businesses right um so you know i agree with the basic concept that the government has no role to play uh, running a business and in any part of the world including india whenever the governments have tried running a business they made a mess of it they use up too many resources they crowd out uh, funding from the market and they crowd out any competitors and basically they write rules to favor themselves and you know you can see examples you know india has hundreds of examples and we went down this path now the problem today is that there are hundreds and thousands of companies which the government owns and you know one there is a, a financial issue of unloading all of those in the market because we may not have the capacity see india hasn't built up sufficient private industry capacity to be able to sustain that because we crowded out in the last 70 years all of our you know in majority of the industries we crowded out private players they aren't large enough to be able to buy some of those assets and that's one of the reasons 
you see that even though we have the world's largest population and we claim to be in you know, a world's large you know number 3 economy we don't have multinational companies which are of indian origin i mean the ones that you have you know are largely based on a uh, sheer volume of work like the infosys or wipro and so on but we haven't actually truly built multinational companies and the reason is not because our private entrepreneurs don't have the brains or don't know how to do it i mean we all know there are hundreds of indians running large companies globally so it's not about the brain power it's not about the hard work it's about that in the last 70 years we sapped out the energy from our entrepreneurs and did not let them grow you know the entire concept of small scale industry where you were penalized if you grow beyond a particular size is basically cutting entrepreneurs at their knees now with that kind of a situation the challenge in front of the government even if they wanted now to give up the socialist mindset and unload all these industries is who is going to buy them who has the money which players have enough capacity so i think it's going to happen because you know the government you know the government basically is running out of money and you know the debt load that they have is too large so they have to get out of running air india and running you know hotels and running you know heavy industries or whatever but it's going to take time and the other part is you know enough political will because most of these government run companies are heavily unionized and the unions tend to be you know a big uh, they have a big impact in terms of elections political parties need to survive so for them to be able to take that position is not going to be easy so i i would like to see that happen what you're saying but you know it is going to take time because of all the things i mentioned plus you know we are all indians and we know how to complicate things even more i mean take gst right we have already made a mess out of it so we are not going to make it easy for ourselves my question is uh, do you think this uh, concept of sharing economy will uh, bring world more closer uh, in respect of job opportunities and other areas what are your point of views okay uh, so i think there was another question earlier about what's going to be the impact on jobs and are these jobs sustainable so you know that there was an era of you know during industrialization or soon after that uh, where it was not uncommon that people spend their entire life at one company uh, i don't think those days are coming back so if if the question is either yours or someone else's that can i look forward to a career where i join and i eventually retire at 65 or whatever from the same company i think it's highly unlikely um maybe the government jobs can still offer that although you know even those are not going to be um you know sustainable in the future so the challenge is going to be that we will have to uh invent ourselves continuously we'll have to learn continuously the concept that you have had two years of education here and your three years of undergrad and now for the rest of your life you never have to learn anything i think is gone a long way away so continuous learning and it is not just about reading you know articles it's about learning new skills is critically important you know i work in it product company and in the in the 10 years that we have been in india and 40 years globally uh, at least seven different technology waves have come in and gone where people who knew the skills had to relearn a brand new language or a brand new tool or a brand new way of doing in our know, writing programs and if they don't then they become irrelevant to the company and that is going to be a reality you know it, it's it's more visible in a it product company but i can see that in almost all companies where if you are not bringing you know kind of the latest thought or the best thing that works for the business then you're no longer relevant so 
are there going to be jobs i think definitely but different kind of jobs jobs where you know you need to figure out which skill set is required by which company and move so moving rapidly uh, is not going to be seen as hey you only spent two years at this company and what happened it is because that's what you were doing there that was relevant then after that the company didn't have a job for you neither were you learning anything so it made sense for you to go and work somewhere else so i think there is going to be greater mobility uh, greater flexibility and long term tenure is not going to be something that you're going to see a lot of at least that's how i see it i, I don't know what, what. and just to relate it to the corporate world yes specialization would always stay so you will be specialized in certain things but there are a lot of industries there are a lot of corporates which work in terms of job rotations so job rotation would always be there like sir said learning is the fundamental so if you know the basics it is not difficult to learn and unlearn so it is important it is not important to uh, learn but it is very important to unlearn because when you unlearn that's when you are open to actually take something new into you so that's that's the crux of it it is not that a uh, sharing economy would put an impact on an individual's job aspirations however specialization would stay but the learning phase learning new technology learning new skills would always enable an individual to grow so to grow in an organization in a in a in a work environment if you grow with learning you would succeed if you just stick to your field probably the growth would be stagnant Good evening panel members my question to you is with regards to the people who are providing goods and services the customers are benefiting by paying a lower price and the uh, the companies who are got to the concept of shared economy are getting their percentage from the people but what about the people who are actually providing goods and services they are complaining they are not getting enough profits as well like for example uber and ola cab drivers they often complain that the prices are being charged is comparatively less for what they can afford like the petrol prices then the uh, maintenance of the car the emi they are paying so what is your take on that because they completely they, they are not able to take ma- ma- the salary at home is not sufficient for the day to day activities what's your take on that so are you are you a student of economics finance, finance. so you understand economics right yes, huh so and you also understand what is demand and supply right and you also understand the uh, principles of price equilibrium right huh? so now you know the answer also <laughs> so but people are often complaining about it eventually because they have to be step second for them also so so let me uh, you know i was just loosening myself uh, you know Uh, thanks to you guys you know giving a big applaud for this uh eventually you know no business or no individual survives uh, if uh, you know the economic imbalance you know is perennial and continuous right so um you know, i used to uh, you know have a conversation within my office with my own colleagues and i used to say this that when you overgrow the company you don't exist and when you underplay on your role you don't exist no either way you don't exist and then you are out of the place so is it better that you take the option a so that you overgrow the position and then move so meaning if you start putting this you know logic to this same economic system you can never be in a position to cross subsidize your business uh, you know uh, for a sustainable period the yes you are now seeing uh, you know those new age economic uh, you know platforms or the businesses which is actually coming up looks like you know uh, uh, cross subsidizing or probably heavily subsidizing just to ensure that there is a value creation through a market console so when they attain a probable you know critical mass market validation or a market consolidation or a market cap Uh, whichever you know normal kitchen you want to use then eventually they attain the bottom line in terms of their uh, you know uh, uh, on the pricing methods pricing models they then have to look forward in terms of movement 
movement to the north, meaning up. So the, the curve is not a you know fixed curve. The curve moves by time. So eventually, no one is you know can sustain a business if economically it becomes unviable. In the previous question, I think Rajiv answered in terms of you know uh, you know what happens to the uh, PSUs or the companies where the government has invested. Now you all hear that. You know, the best of the valuation you get at the maximum, at the, at the time when you achieve the maximum profit. And you will see that, you know, those companies being sold. You will see those companies being sold. Why? That's the maximum. But the profit maximization is something, a rule which uh, align to the risk appetite of that, you know, group of individual or an individual or even a company. If you could just go back you know, 10 years before, what was the uh, Nifty index? Anyone? Or a Sensex? Anyone? Huh? Ten years back. So, ten years back, uh, you know, your market was showing around seven, eight thousand Sensex, right? Huh? There are buyers and sellers there, right? Huh? Infosys was how much at that time? Whatever that money. Right? Now today what is the Sensex? So Nifty itself is 10,000. Well, they are saying 10,000. Uh, Nifty, Nifty itself is 10,000. Right? Now at 10,000, 10 years before, somebody bought shares and somebody sold shares. Right? You understand? The risk appetite of the seller at that moment has already reached the cap. It has reached the cap. But at the same time, the buyer's risk appetite has actually started there. He is at the lowest. He is at the lowest. So there is a change of hands. Now the same buyer, 10 years before what he has bought, he is now exiting at 30,000. But still there is another buyer. And this is what you call it as an economic system in one way or other, pricing methods and so on and so forth. It's a question of the risk versus the price is what matters. Or in other words, in your own economic system, you call it as a premium or a reward for the value what you perceive as a risk value, right? So in any economic system, when there is a loss, if as long as, you know, it is a short term, which which there is a very, very clear plan or the business plan which basically you know, works towards, you know, uh, not only uh, taking that, you know, low ebb of the uh, curve, but as well there is a huge plan of investments which we actually brings them up into the system and eventually bring the risk into a manageable portion. Obviously, you know, the price tends to move. This is a simple economic theory I'm putting. I would rather appreciate you that you just put this same, you know, process of, you know, economic principles into the questions what you have asked, you know what is the answer. So, no one can do a business if that does not make, for the matter, if that does not make a value creation, it does not make an economic sense. Your price is an equilibrium based on the demand and supply. If you find there are too much of demand, supply is low, then there is a surge pricing. If there is a, too much of supply and there is no demand, the price goes for a topple. Now what happens? The simple record of theory says that, you know, you probably bring down the supply. And bring down the supply can also arise because of the investments go low. Probably you will find, uh, you know, something else is actually, you know, attracting more investments where the basic oversupply industry probably will not invest money there. So this is an economic chain which keeps happening once in six years say for, a, for a given industry, it could be four years, could be eight years and so on and so forth. Can I just add uh, a couple of points to what Balaji said. So on the macro basis, Balaji is absolutely right. That's how the economy will work. I think if I understood your question also was you were looking for on a micro basis, what is the impact on a taxi driver who is not earning enough? I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, the transition of any economy, anywhere in the world, 
uh, you know, is a painful process. It's painful in terms of how individuals get impacted. They have to reskill, they have to relearn. You know, Navneet ta Navpreet talked about unlearning and changing jobs or changing uh, streams. It definitely is a painful process. The problem is that if we were to get caught up, uh, you know, you can't stop that change. And that's where I think, you know, uh, that's one of the roles that government can play. One of our challenges in our country is that the government has dabbled in things it should not have instead of focusing on things like security, welfare. Those are things that would have created and can create a foundation on which the country can be built. I mean, you have a secure environment where there is trust, where there is honesty, where the rule of law is followed. You know, that, that enables business to perform. Individuals get impacted, there is a welfare uh, system that comes in, either unemployment insurance or you know, unemployment payment, which helps people kind of get back on their feet. Those are things that need to come in. Those are places where the government has a clear role to play, where they need to get into and do it, and that's what they have currently abandoned. Uh, so are, are what you're saying is correct? It is. And unfortunately, at this point, we have left the market forces to kind of deal with it. Panel members, so as the share economy, new companies will emerge for offering new, uh, for fulfilling the customer needs. So if companies doesn't adopt or change, they will be myopic. So the, how does the geopolitics will be impacting the share economy companies like India, China Sea Belt, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, USA tightening the immigration plans and India and China, all these things and government policy like GST, FDA, GST on manufacturing unit as GST caps. How does the company will be affected with the, all these things? Okay, that's a very big question to ask and I'm sure like Joita said, our, our, you know, So in some ways, it's a great closure question for this session, I think, right? Uh, so I'll take this first shot and then, you know, the rest of the panelists can jump in. See, the geopolitics, the impact of geopolitics on business and on the new economy, there is always going to be an impact of, you know, all the things that are happening at a very large scale. Now, I think the interesting point that exists today is that increasingly the companies and businesses don't really care, you know, what a country is wanting to do or not wanting to do or their relationships, you know, between two countries and so on. So, you know, for if you take any of the global companies, to them, you know, the entire world represents an opportunity in which you can provide goods and services and create, you know, create an opportunity for, for the shareholders, create an opportunity for consumers and make money out of it. So it is irrelevant in a lot of ways whether there is relationships uh, which are, you know, what, what is the level of relationships. And in a lot of ways, governments today are more stuck in the past because they are still stuck in terms of boundaries and, you know, kind of drawing up uh, you know, geographical boundaries and saying this is my side and that's your side and fighting over the sides. If you think about it, corporate, you know, from a corporate point of view, it is, those lines are irrelevant. And in fact, the blurring of lines, you know, like what happened in, or what has happened in, you know, European Union is the way, you know, eventually where the global future lies, where the lines are blurred and there is free movement of goods and services and people. I think it's a long way off. Until then, we'll have to deal with, you know, all these political issues and, you know, uh, enmities between countries and so on. Um, but, you know, I think that's where the eventual future lies for, for the world. With that, I would like to thank everyone here in the panel and all of you students for, you know, bringing out some very valuable points, asking some very relevant questions and uh, spending these last uh, two, two and a half hours was very valuable to me personally, learned quite a few things from, you know, this interaction and uh, thank you so much for listening to us today.
Have a great day ahead. Thank you panel members for sharing your views on shared economy and giving us real life examples such as Uber, Ola, Zoomcar, etc. and also telling us about the challenges faced in such an economy. You also talked about how resources can be shared by making it cost effective, the steps to be taken by the government to regulate such an economy and the competencies required to be a part of such an economy. Thank you once again for enlightening us with your words of wisdom.